let's see. Uh, can everyone hear me fine? Uh, for August, we're going to be talking about exchange, trade, and the relationship between these economic activities and feasting in the southwestern United States. So, uh, before we dive in too deep, I of course want to thank the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project for, again, the opportunity to uh, deliver these talks. Great, sounds like I'm coming through clear. Um, so yeah, we'll get we'll get right into this here. Uh, hopefully, not experience any tef technical difficulties this month as we normally do. I'm going to be appearing right here on the uh, right hand of your screen, and uh, yeah, so let's dive right in. the The idea of using archaeology to examine economic activity in the past is not a far stretch. After all, archaeology is inherently a materials science, and so when working with physical materials, economic activity is rather a natural subject to address. This may seem a bit strange coming from me as someone who likes to address the uh, almost immaterial things like iconography and sound, but I, I still address these through a materials-oriented process. I still examine the physical aspects of the archaeological record in order to make uh, scientifically substantiated inferences about these you know, more fleeting, more immaterial things. Uh, same can be said about economic activity. After all, at its very core, economics is about the movement of materials within the social sphere. That movement itself is something that has happened in the past and is not necessarily, you know, when we're recovering this, we're not interested in what it's doing now. We're interested in what it did in the past, which is a series of movements which has ended. Uh, however, again, we take a materials approach to it based on sourcing, typology, construction techniques, technology, imagery on it, and the context in which we find it. And of course, any archaeologist will tell you context is everything. And from all those lines of evidence, we can then begin to deduce what this has to do with the exchange of goods, with uh, various concepts of value, and what that means for the relationships of uh, microeconomics within, within households and with, within communities, as well as the macroeconomic processes between communities, between uh, sort of regional spheres. And the Southwest is a great place to examine this. After all, the Southwest had strong economic ties, uh, famously to Mesoamerica, uh, but also to the Great Basin, the Mojave Desert, uh, as well as to regions to the north. And as we're going to cover uh, in a couple of the examples in this talk, to the Great Plains as well. Interestingly, though, economics was not always a focal point of archaeological research. In fact, you could say that for the better part of the first century of the existence of archaeology as a discipline, economics was not something that we talked about. Of course, early on, archaeology had to sort of cut its teeth on um, how do we define things like culture, time periods, and how do they relate to the materials that we're recovering. But there were, after we began to address those, there were some things that got in the way of addressing economics and archaeology. Because by the time we started to pin those things down, we find ourselves in the immediate era post-World War II. And, and so in the, the post-war, Cold War times, economics became taboo to talk about. Well, why? Well, at the time, the best sources, especially in the social sciences, for breaking down economics into its constituent components and thinking about those in an analytical way came from the writings of Marx. Now, I'm not talking necessarily about the Communist Manifesto, 
But Marx had some insightful, if incomplete, analysis of the ways in which things come to acquire value, the different sorts of value in which things can, which things can hold, including, um, you know, the investment in labor and the relationship of labor to the processes of production and the creation of value in material goods. However, social scientists in uh, post-war archaeological practice, especially in the Western world, couldn't really address uh, economics using Marxism uh, because of McCarthyism. And to really get a handle on how extreme the, the pressures of McCarthyism were on academic discourse is that to reference Marx, not based on political ideology, but based even on some of these analytic tools for addressing economic practice would be to severely jeopardize one's own career. Um, we tend to think of tenure as this, you know, sort of um, highly defensible fortification that once you get tenure, you're, you're behind this and impervious to uh, the politics around you. But that was not the case when it came to referencing Mark, Marx during McCarthyism. So as a result, we developed a bunch of other theoretical structures and other approaches that uh, actually kind of represent some of the theoretical divides between uh, different camps of scholars and even certain academic institutions and anthropology departments today. Now, of course, Marx does come with certain political implications, and it's somewhat erroneous to project these onto the past. So more recently, some scholars have attempted to apply neoliberalism, a term that some of you may be familiar with out there, which is a post-war capitalist economic philosophy. Um, so some archaeological scholars have attempted to apply neoliberalism in order to interpret economic activity in the archaeological past without necessarily referencing Marx. However, neoliberalism, even more so than Marxism, but Marxism included too, these face the same problem, is that we are projecting modern ideas for uh, Marxism, 19th century and, and onward uh, ideologies, and for neoliberalism, middle 20th century and onward ideologies onto a past in which very different economic activities might have played a role. The Southwest is a fantastic example of very different economic structures that aren't really quite clearly captured, but we do find tools in some of the Marxist discourse for addressing these. However, those tools are limited, and so we really do have to think about the Southwest in different terms. So, again, we turn back to the archaeological record, back to the material evidence. And first, we might look at Mesoamerica. As I mentioned, there are strong ties between Mesoamerica and the American Southwest, especially economic ties, in that we see the movement of goods and materials between Mesoamerica and the Southwest. Some of those examples we'll come back to Oftentimes, scholars might call these exotics in that they are trade goods from a great distance. Some of those trade goods even included live animals like macaws. Now, in the South, well, in, in Mesoamerica, before I get ahead of myself, in Mesoamerica, there is uh, significant evidence of um, market activities. Now, certainly there was a planned centralized component to some of the uh, larger city-state polities in Mesoamerica. In other words, that there uh, was a sort of accrual of materials among the political elite of a particular polity who then were able to redistribute it in certain contexts. But we also see a very strong component of the Mesoamerican economy was based on market economics. Now, of course, when I say market economics, I'm not necessarily saying, you know, capitalism and that we need to look at this through the neoliberal lens. However, the sort of mercantilism that capitalism was born out of 
is at least a rough approximation, if crude and very imperfect, of the sorts of markets that happened in Mesoamerica. So when I say market economies, I, I mean individuals taking agency over their own economic roles to negotiate trade on an individual basis. When I talk about physical market spaces, that is a public space set aside for these sorts of interactions. It is particularly enabled by having a sort of sedentary residential society as opposed to a more nomadic, for example, hunter-gatherer society. Now, the southwestern United States could have had markets, but as a general rule of thumb, we don't see evidence of physical market spaces. We do see multi-purpose communal spaces like plazas, and we do see economic activities in those plazas, but often those economic activities might be something more like production processes, not necessarily exchange. There is a big exception to that, and uh, recently scholars have um, very thoroughly argued for the evidence of market spaces, public market spaces in the Hohokam region in uh, the southern part of the southwest. Now, Hohokam also had ball courts, which we don't see in the rest of the southwest, so that shows a much stronger connection to the Mesoamerican system, both religious system and, since the ball courts are in association with the market spaces, the Mesoamerican economic system. And that's kind of a theme that I'm going to be playing on today, is this back and forth, or not necessarily back and forth, this uh, intimate connection between market spaces, uh, or rather between economic activity and uh, religious ideology. So yeah, we see market spaces with heavy Mesoamerican influences, but that's really for just the Hohokam and not for the rest of the Southwest. Something else we can look at is um, the activities of nomadic hunter-gatherers. And these establish a fantastic baseline for looking at um, or hypothesizing about economic activity in the deep past and what we call the archaic period here in the southwest and depending where you are in the southwest the archaic period ends at different times but generally it begins uh, after the end of the Pleistocene at the beginning of the Holocene and continuing from the early Holocene to the middle Holocene. Does that mean? That means generally around the time that we had the climate that we do now after the last ice age. Um, during the Archaic period, uh, which preceded Pueblo times, people in the Southwest tended to be highly mobile, nomadic hunter-gatherers. And that's the cultural pattern that we see uh, in the Great Basin all the way up through the 19th century. And so we can look at the Great Basin and the sorts of economic activities that happened there and think about how those can help us understand what might have happened in the archaic in the southwest and there is a lot of good evidence that um, we can use that as as an analogy to to create a, a sort of comparative study again there's always caveats to using analogies like this but there is strong evidence that it, it is broadly applicable. And so we think that um, archaic period economic activity likely followed a Great, pa Great Basin pattern. And when I say Great Basin, that is also included, inclusive of the Mojave Desert. So in the Mojave Desert, we have, um, first, we have the distribution of materials in relationship to pilgrimages, both the acquisition of materials based on pilgrimages to particular places and this is very very closely related to that sort of um, nomadic hunter-gatherer life way of you take a uh, throughout the year you take a circuit throughout and if you imagine this is the area that you live in you take a circuit throughout that to hit the seasonal resources about the time that they come into season all right so then if that was the ancestral circuit that you did 
and and now you're living with a group that does this circuit but there's something important about getting the same stuff that your ancestors had you might make the pilgrimage over to here now you don't want to intrude in someone else's territory without their permission because that's you know grounds for warfare and so there's um there's sort of a, a system um sort of built up around that along the way on these pilgrimages to get uh, to get particular resources. There is some evidence, especially in the Mojave Desert, of the scattering of materials along the way. Um, this might be true for, say, potsherds. Um, so, yeah, again, the, the pilgrimages also might be to a sacred place, not necessarily to gather a resource, but these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. We see evidence of this kind of activity in the Southwest, of ritual pilgrimages, of returning to ancestral sources of uh, raw materials, such as toolstone, uh, pigments, etc. Again, we'll, we'll get to some of these. So we do see some of this in the Southwest during post-contact times, what we sometimes call Pueblo Five, um, from the time of Spanish contact, you know, up through, and really Pueblo Five continues today. Um, so this is chronicled. We have evidence prior to contact of this happening, very strong evidence, especially during what we hear in the Northern Rio Grande call the classic period from about 1300 or 1350 up to Spanish contact. Um, just prior to 1600 here in the northern Rio Grande, closer to about 1550 down in the Albuquerque area. Um, so we see a bit of that. The other thing that people do in the Great Basin and the Mojave Desert is that they gather for feasts, for, um, uh, for, for public gatherings and feasts. And so that's something I'll, I'll, I'll touch on as well. Um, but that's really the focus of how do these materials circulate in the context of feasts and preparation for feasts. So here are some of the materials. Here are some of the materials that we're going to be covering um, throughout the rest of the talk. And we're just going to be looking at the circulation of tool stones, uh, things that we archaeologists just casually call chert, which is if you're a geologist, includes any type of cryptocrystalline silicate. And we're not going into a geology lesson on what makes it cryptocrystalline silicate. Uh, also obsidian, volcanic glass. Obsidian is volcanic glass. Easy to explain. The circulation of pottery, both of uh, ceramic vessels, uh, including utility wares, decorated wares, uh, as well as flows. This is the term that I borrow from Mesoamerican archaeology. In Mesoamerican archaeology, flows means figurines, whistles, ocarinas. Here in the Southwest, I'm going to mean musical instruments, so flutes, whistles, and ocarinas. Also, the raw materials to make these things, to make pottery and to decorate it. And finally, the discard products of uh, pottery also have their own sort of economic life. Like I just mentioned with the Mojave Desert, there's some evidence of uh, broken pot sherds being scattered along the way on pilgrimages. Of course, we've got special materials such as turquoise and quartz and those exotic items that I mentioned before, which include uh, worked shell from the California coast, uh, shell trumpets, probably coming from further south, um, such as conch shell trumpet, trumpets, and bells certainly coming from Mes Mesoamerica. And things that are difficult to access, but sometimes we get a little a little clue that they were there are perishables, including basketry, textiles, hides, and cordage. Especially hides and basketry and textiles may have been a substantial part of the economic activity of the past. Oh, yeah, if you want to see these, there we go. I'll hide my face for a moment. Um, yeah, hides textiles and basketry may have been a substantial component of the economic activity in the past, even if they are only a minuscule part of the archaeological record due to preservation. We should also think about the commodities, this is a loaded term, uh, the sorts of things that would be exchanged, the things that would have been held within the baskets, within the pots. 
Um, and these could include pigments, both for potting, as well as the pigments that were used on human bodies and in the production of pictographs. Other commodities, something that might not fit into a pot would be wood as for construction material or for fuel uh, and preserved meat. Um, we might also see in those baskets and the pottery seeds, nuts, grains. Um, we should also think about the exchange of other things like salt, uh, often overlooked in the present day, but in most ancient economies around the world, salt was important especially if you're not on the coast. Uh, and because of those Mesoamerican connections, we're gonna talk a little bit about cacao. And then I just wanna to briefly touch on entheogens. These are uh, medicinal materials often derived from plants used in a religious context. So the circulation contexts in which things might be traded. So we've got short and long distance trade and we can't discount that someone might actually bother to go out somewhere or to come back. We might see something like that with Plains Pueblo interactions because folks on the Plains would know to come to the Pueblos, which are a you know fixed point in space. Um, folks from the Plains would provide, say, preserved bison meat, hides, uh, in exchange for uh, things like corn, seeds, and nuts. Um, and so you definitely get strong exchange like that. So you might have groups that just periodically come by and trade. Um, we touched on those offerings and ritual deposits. So you might have a shrine at some place that you leave an offering at. And that may or may not be related to the pilgrimages for raw materials. Again, markets are, at least in the Hohokam area, uh, a place where people might exchange goods, but we're probably looking at a completely different economic system anywhere north of the Hohokam area. Another thing is gambling. And this is one of those things that's difficult to talk about in anthropology because gambling in the Western context comes with certain, uh, certain connotations and often gets ascribed a certain moral value that is, you know, well, considered amoral by a lot of folks. In the instances of traditional Native American gambling, one, you know, we're not looking at people playing blackjack. Um, there are different games that are a part of this and learning, um, learning the game and how to play it and how to participate in it is certainly a part of ritual life. And these, um, the, these, what we would call gambling, uh, was a way of redistributing materials. So those who had a surplus might be willing to wager that surplus, leaving it up to chance for someone who might need it to acquire it, or someone at least with less access to acquire it. There is also evidence in the archeological record that this has not played favorably for some individuals. Um, something that we can touch on, but I'm not gonna go too deeply in. But gambling was seen as a form of redistribution and was thus a part of the economic life. Gambling could be done at gatherings like feasts, dances, and um, w within that context. And so, as well as potlatches, which we're not going to talk too much about potlatches here, um, but again, it's a part of that re redistribution of wealth and of surplus. So yeah, potlatches or potlucks, that's the question. Um, we all know what a potluck is, right? We get together, we share food um, versus a potlatch. This is something that we see more in the Pacific Northwest where uh, there's also an exchange of gifts um, sometimes competitive gifting, but we're probably not seeing potlatches in the Southwest. We're probably seeing something more like potlucks. So that brings us to feasting as economic action. As um, <laughs> James Potter, not that James Potter, James Potter said in 2000, 
The communal exchange and sharing of food may be considered one of the most fundamental human tra <laughs> sorry, one of the most fundamental human transactions. Um, and he's very much right. Because if you think about that potluck, and this is, I have to give a nod to uh, Judith Habicht Mosh because I'm going to be uh, somewhat um, parroting uh, the words that she uses is, when you go to a potluck and you bring your casserole dish and your good Tupperware and, and, and the foods in that, like, do you always go home with that? Um, you know, often, your casserole dish doesn't come back with you, whether by you know intent or by accident or whatever, right? Um, same thing, if you happen to be hosting the potluck, you may find that the next day when, it, when it's all over, you've suddenly acquired a bunch of new Tupperware and casserole dishes that, <laughs> right? Where'd these come from? And so, when we're talking about things like baskets and ceramic vessels, um, these are absolutely a part of the uh, the economic exchange that happens during feasting. But really, they are so much in the context of uh, the the value is in both the casserole dish, the the decorated pot, the finely woven basket, and the thing that's in it, the food. Um, and so. Yeah, the thing about feasting, though, is it can, when you get all together like that, it can either reinforce social cohesion. You think about getting together with your, uh, getting together with your family for Thanksgiving. That kind of reinforces those family bonds that might otherwise, you know, be tenuous throughout the year, either by distance or by different ideologies. But feasting can also be a place for people to reinforce their rank or to engage in self-promotion, what we might call competitive feasting. And it does seem like in the Southwest, we went from reinforcing cohesion to reinforcing rank to back to reinforcing cohesion. I'll get to that in just another slide or two. Um, but most essentially, what I'm trying to uh, get at here is that feasting is a time that you get to renegotiate uh, economic and social ties. It promotes redistribution and interdependence. Say like this was, if this was a bumper crop year for corn, but you know where we normally go gather our pine nuts happened to burn down and we don't have our normal source of pine nuts, well, we can exchange some of that bumper crop to offset the resources that we're lacking. Um, it's also an opportunity to get together with folks that you don't normally see. Again, think about that, that family dinner, doing this on the, the scale of communities, of polities, basically city-states, um, where you see someone from another area, um, possibly another, uh, another ethnic group or, um, or a neighboring political unit, um, and you can engage in things like building alliances, sometimes through marriage. Um, you can mediate conflict by uh, reducing it, by creating the sort of ritual outlet rather than engaging in violence. Um, and this is also, it provides a venue for exchanging religious knowledge. We should also think about the value of religious knowledge um, when we're talking about economics, even though it's something that's very hard to, to, to really physically grasp on. So I want to talk about Chaco Canyon because Chaco Canyon really kind of highlights that change from, we think about, um, you know, I talked about the archaic period and we probably had feasting of people getting together. And even though Chaco doesn't have really a, a strong archaic component to it, we do see in early Chaco some of that um, some of that early activity um, or some of that activity that I was suggesting probably happened dur during the archaic happening at Chaco. In other words, you have people coming from all around. A lot of the people coming into Chaco very well could have been nomadic peoples um, who then uh, came to this more fixed place 
to engage in the religious life of Chaco, in the feasting and the political life. These were all uh, significantly intertwined. So Chaco was established during what we call the basket maker period, which is essentially a transitional period from, from these earlier times of the archaic to something that's more recognizably Pueblo. Uh, the basket maker period is when, when these communities first started consolidating together and then Chaco really hits its height when we hit the, uh, the Pueblo period. And um, when we get to what we call Pueblo one and Pueblo two, um, and so we're looking at Chaco was roughly occupied around 900 AD to um, it might have started around 750 AD, um, really picked up around 900 AD, and then was pretty much um, pretty much left empty by about 1250, um, and that's probably in part because of this change in how feasting was. And remember in that earlier time, we would imagine that people would come together from different areas, that feasting was more about promoting cohesion between people who don't normally see each other. But by the time we get the Chaco phenomenon, we have strong evidence that people were throwing feasts competitively and bringing in tributes from around. After all, one of the materials that is most critical to Chaco Canyon um, was wood. And Chaco Canyon itself doesn't have much wood. It doesn't today, it didn't in the past, not when it really flourished at least. So where did this wood come from? Well, it came from other mountain ranges, um, from nearby mountain ranges. And so people had to carry all that in and that is a part of the economic contribution and the economic activity to Chaco. We should also think about labor. Chaco took a lot of labor to build, more than likely more labor than the permanent residential community. So if you, again, Chaco, so Chaco doesn't have much wood. It also didn't have very much in the way of um, good farmland. It did have some, it, it's a little bit more mod, marginal now than it was in the past because Chaco Wash has kind of cut down um, but at its height it could have probably uh, supported a few hundred people and yet we have evidence of you know on the scale of thousands of people participating in the feasts at Chaco Canyon so where did they come from well we have some evidence of people coming from as far away as um, uh, possibly folks as far away as the eastern edge of California uh, participating in the Chaco ceremonies before returning back to their homeland. Um, people are coming from far around. We have trade goods all the way from central Mexico coming up here. Again, those macaws, um, shell trumpets, and other things. So people are coming in from very far around to build Chaco and so they're contributing labor they're contributing um, tribute and this is all a part of the economics of feasting at Chaco so what does it take to put on a feast well you have to have something to prepare your food you have to have something to cut your meats to prepare your uh, vegetable foods to uh, prepare your grains so we've got toolstone and um, actually this is a uh, a little bit of uh, unconscious bias, and I should have added to this slide groundstone too, although groundstone typically not always comes more locally, but groundstone is, it, it is a tool made of stone used to process foods for feasting. So it should be on this slide here. Um, but we also have uh, tools for uh, making cutting implements, um, such as cherts, cryptocrystalline silicates in technical terms, um, coarser stones like quartzite and basalt, not quartz, but quartzite, um, and obsidian. So people would make, uh, first there's the pilgrimage aspect. People would trek from far around to landmarks like the one that you see pictured here, which happens to be visible from a great distance away 
but also sits very near to a source of crypto crystalline silicates, or in short, chert. Chert that was very beautiful and made for great stone tools. Um, and so this was a place that was used for centuries, if not millennia, um, probably more likely for millennia. Um, in fact, different ethnic groups would come make the trek to this place to get the materials and then return back. Other, I mean, um, yeah, but things that have traveled farther been things like shells. So I mentioned that worked shell all the way from California has made it out to the Southwest. We also have things from conches only grow in really in, uh, or they only thrive in tropical waters. Um, so conch trumpets like the one pictured here uh, have been found at Chaco Canyon, which if you look at Chaco, uh, See my there's Chaco right there. Here's Hohokam, and um, or is that one? Okay, young. Um, so yeah, we've we've got shell trumpets here at Chaco. They're coming all the way from way below off the screen. So part of the circulation of goods to sort of throw a feast musical instruments in this case, and an exotic good. So on the topic of exotic goods that are also musical instruments, we have bells. Copper bells beginning in Mesoamerica's post-classic, which the post-classic in Mesoamerica begins roughly around 1100 AD, again, depending on where you are and who you're reading. Um, so we get copper bells coming up from Mesoamerica all the way to Chaco, such as um, these copper bells were covered in the Southwest by Withers way back in the 1940s. And then consumables and commodities, right? So there are so many things that, um, uh, again, go into making the feast. We, we just talked about a couple of types of musical instruments to put on the performance. We talked about a couple of things that can be brought in for the tools, for the processing of the food. Um, but we should also think about, you know, pigments for bodies for pictographs because the production of pictographs might have occurred in some of these kinds of contexts, not everywhere. Um, and it's highly debated but some of the same pigments used for pictographs were also used on bodies and bodies would, uh, and, and these pigments would certainly have been applied to bodies during certain gatherings like feasts and dances. Um, like I talked about with Chaco, wood for both construction material, but also for fuel. You need fuel to prep all this food, um, but you also need it to construct the, the places and the venues. Preserved meats, uh, I talked about bison coming in from uh, from the plains, but we should also think about fresh game. After all, feasts and dances might be held around the time that it was time to get together for a uh, communal hunt. Um, this might be a communal hunt of large game, so uh, largely of hunting parties going out getting large game, and holding a, a, a feast for that, uh, but also of smaller game. So some of the Pueblos considered um, lagomorphs, which would be jackrabbits, cottontails, to be ideal food for feasts because it's available roughly year round. Um, and so this also as an aside, since we've addressed um, We've touched on gender in some of the other talks. Uh, that means a, probably a different gendering of who's involved, where hunts for small game might involve the entire community, men, women, children. Um, hunts for large game might have primarily been male hunting parties or hunting parties that were primarily male. This isn't to say that women couldn't hunt, but that, 
the division of labor was mostly um, male hunters, mostly. Again, caveats. Um, we see seeds, nuts, and grains. Again, um, the gendered division of labor on these, especially on the production of grains on you know farming and processing, was ver variable between pueblos and between time periods. Um, but these so our preserved meats our fresh game our seeds our nuts our grains cacao and other uh special goods were coming in 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 the vessels which we're about to talk about and on the topic of cacao right right there desiccated cacao pod how horrible is that like it's like a, a shelled out avocado that wants to bite you like an avocado with dentures sorry like cacao pods kind of like freak me out but yeah when i'm talking about cacao i'm i'm, I'm talking about that thing right there so perishables and this can include the things that are, are that that our goods are coming in you know our cordage might be used to bind wood into bundles, um, to bind uh, bind together, um, you know, hides and textiles to make them more easily transported. Um, the textiles themselves can be worn. They were certainly uh, valued goods um, for exchange and very important in ceremonial life. Um, textiles and hides. Um, basketry again all that food stuff has to come in something sometimes what it came in was baskets right and so the basket has a certain value of its own so for example in the Shoshone of Death Valley when they participated in in feasts with neighboring groups it was the mesquite beans from Death Valley that were most prized but Death Valley was also known for producing some of the, uh, the, the finest, finest woven, most decorative basketry in the region. And so when attending a feast, they bring fine basket with the prized mesquite beans. And so the, the, the value of the contribution, contribution is the combined value of the mesquite beans and the basket, right? Um, Again, other things that are hard to, to track, feathers, including on the whole birds. So we've got some evidence of bones from macaws, but um, macaw bones are small, fragile, and there's a good chance that they haven't always preserved. And then I also want to talk about reeds because we also talk about flows, right? Like I said, I'm using this in the term of uh, Flutes, whistles, and ocarinas, and some of the flutes in the Southwest were made of perishable materials. Um, and yet those were a part of the economic activity. So we also have whistles, uh, both of ceramic and of bone, and to a lesser extent, ocarinas like uh, that example that you've probably seen from uh, an earlier talk of mine. We also have utility wares that are used. Um, so these are ceramic pots made for cooking and decorative household wares, such as the one right behind my face. So this image, um, I was on the fence about showing it, whether I should show it or not, because it has this hole here, which may or may not be what we call a kill hole. But we have, what's important about this is we have these figures. Um, we have human figure, animal figure, and you know various states of transformation in between human and animal, what we call a therianthropic figure. Um, so like a human body with an animal head. And they're holding musical instruments. And this is all shown on the pottery. So we have evidence of the ceremonial aspect of, um, of the dance that accompanies the feasting or the object here, 
the pot that represents the feasting that accompanies the dance. And we have indications of the performance and the musicality, including things like whatever this implement is and these rattles, which ha are most likely uh, made of perishable materials and have um, since perished from the archeological record. And so in that way, uh, pots are one of the strongest examples. You can, you can imagine that thing holding foodstuffs and being used for serving, right? Um, and so that's another thing that when we're looking for, um, when we're looking for evidence of feasting, we're looking at say concentrations of serving wares, such as the one behind my head. Um, we also sh should think about the circulation of the raw materials, such as clays, the tempers that go into them, and the pigments used to make the designs, like you just saw. And then again, sherds can be uh, distributed in a uh, religious context, not only as offerings and pilgrimages, like I mentioned, but um, they can be reshaped to make the pottery that then accompanies the feast as well as um, reshaped into game pieces. So I talked about uh, indigenous games of gambling as a mode of redistribution. We do have some, uh, we have strong evidence of some games that utilized ceramic sherds as game pieces. And so again, that can be evidence of gatherings, feasting, um, communal gathering. So yeah, that's, about it for the talk. I will be hanging on the air for a few minutes here to uh, take your questions if you have any. But um, yeah, here's the references. You can um, find those also in the description below. Um, again, just select references. This is actually a rather broad topic and um, yeah, th these will get you a start, but there, there's a lot of writing uh, on this. I'm particularly a fan of some of the authors listed here. So yeah, uh, if you're curious, check them out. Um, and then we're gonna, all right, just switch to my face. So yeah, um, with that, I wanna ask, uh, do you have any questions? Put your questions in chat. Um, you know, while I'm waiting on that, uh, I do want to say, uh, again, thank you for everyone who tuned in. Thank you to the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project for giving me the opportunity to share these sorts of, um, to share this sort of content with you. If you enjoyed the kind of content that you saw today, um, there's actually a lot of effort that goes into researching these topics and preparing for a talk like this. So again, if you appreciated this, um, go to our website, Check out our online store. Um, get some of our uh, some of our swag right here. Right. Um, so of course we have merchandise. Um, consider donating to the project. Uh, I, I I wish um, you know I kind of wish this pandemic thing would settle down because we we still have to be closed for tours. So I can't encourage you to come for tours because we're not doing any yet. We do continually get questions about tours and, um, you know, thank you for everyone who's interested first. Um, and we will be posting to our social media accounts, um, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, about, you know, any progress on tours and of course, providing more digital content. Uh, we're still working on trying to provide some digital, digital content in lieu of tours for the time being. Um, for the, uh, yeah, if no one else has any questions, um, I'll just wait here for, for one more moment. Oh, here we go. Um, y yeah, um, of course, Deanna, shout out to the, uh, the Shoshone and to Death Valley. Uh, couldn't leave them out of this talk. Um, interesting tie-in is that in my um, in my prior research, I think I've identified a rock art motif in Death Valley that could either be a reference to an origin myth and or, because it could be both, 
it looks a lot like that image of a of a cacao pod. If I can, um, I'm gonna bring that back onto the screen very quickly here. There was a, a rock art motif that looked so much like this thing. It had the the same kind of uh, football shape with a kind of like you know up and down line here, like it was uh, indicating the seeds um, within the sectioned cacao pod. So that might be some of the evidence that um, Shoshone from Death Valley might have been making the pilgrimage uh, out to some of these uh, sites in the Southwest and participating in the ceremonies where trade goods from Mesoamerica, like the cacao pod, uh, had been found. So, yeah, all right. Well, um, again, thank you everyone for uh, tuning in. We've got, you know, I, I see folks from uh, several different states, so it's pretty good. Um, everyone have a good weekend. Enjoy the... Uh, enjoy the latter part of summer and i will see you all for uh our chat in september usually these are on the second friday um however i'm going to be away so it will actually be the third friday of september also before i go i want to make a quick plug for our mesa talks series our very own candy bardouin will be giving a talk on her uh best of the best and that is going to be on Tuesday the 25th I believe um, so uh, do uh, make sure to tune in the link will be on our Facebook page we will later on upload it to our YouTube channel tune in for Candy Bordun's talk you'll see the best of the best from the uh, 2019 recording and um, yeah uh, cheers oh yeah this is uh for Star Trek fans out there, out there, this is um, Earl Grey tea or tea Earl Grey hot. <laughs>